I am in Scotland, and this is Loch Ness right behind me. I'm on Loch Ness, seriously. Um, I think it's been something like over 50 episodes of Monsterology, and I'm just now getting around to Loch Ness Monster. So today's episode is obviously on the Loch Ness Monster, and uh, this is particularly difficult for me because this is my phobia, deep water, uh, and what leviathans could be lurking underneath. So here it is. Loch Ness Monster. Welcome. It's pretty deep. It's about 750 feet deep, which is about half the depth uh, of, say, the Empire State Building. Not that deep, but it's extremely long. Uh, many miles. I don't know if it's like 20 miles long or something. It's crazy. Some people have said you could put all the water from all the locks in Scotland inside Loch Ness. That's how big it is. One thing you'll notice is that the water is really dark. That's because peat from the uh, mountains flows into the water and makes it very murky. Uh, also, the lake never freezes over. So that's another reason why the creature could be inside somewhere. Okay, so today we're going to be doing a sort of a traditional charcoal drawing. And um, then I'm going to go over You're going to see me go over it with acrylic paint. And then uh, I import it into my iPad and finish it with some digital uh, layers. This is uh, just some footage from Loch Ness. And uh, when I was out there, I was really creeped out. I mean, all of us have our own particular phobias and fears. And for me, it's deep water. Uh, evolutionary psychologists suggest that the reason why many of us are afraid of deep water is that, of course, um, not only could we, our ancestors have drowned and therefore certain kinds of um, innate phobias about water might have been selected for, but also a lot of predators are just waiting to uh, attack you. Uh, when I was in Africa, it was very common to see uh, any animal that any mammal that wanted to go get a drink of water in the nearby river or lake had to face um, crocodiles and snakes and this kind of thing. So one could argue that it's part of our evolutionary history to have a certain kind of fear about uh, deep water or murky water. And ever since I was a little kid, I've been afraid of the Loch Ness Monster. Um, I used to watch the Leonard Nimoy in search of, and it was kind of a big deal when I was a kid. Um, now I don't think it's as popular, but uh, you never know when it's going to have a renaissance. The story of the Loch Ness Monster goes back to uh, the 6th century. Uh, in 565, an Irish missionary named Columba uh, claimed to see a beast in the river Ness. So this is not the lake, but the river, which is a tributary. And Columba uh, had heard a tale of a dangerous water beast, so he sent one of his apprentices, one of his devotees, to swim across the river. And uh, sure enough, the monster emerged and started to approach. But Columba uh, said, shouted out, you know, go no further, go back at once. And the monster miraculously heeded the command. So this became sort of part of the early legend of the Loch Ness Monster. But it really got going in the 1930s. Uh, the Inverness Courier uh, reported the first modern sighting, and that was, um, I think, in 1933. And then a sort of a steady stream of sightings uh, came fast and furious through the 30s. In 1933, Mr. Alec Campbell described seeing a whale-like creature, which was, uh, quote, churning in the lock. And in 34. Uh, came the very famous photo called the surgeon's photo. Uh, British surgeon Colonel Robert Wilson took the famous photo. Uh, I'm sure you've seen it. And uh, it stood as sort of the most defining image of a long-necked creature with a small head. Um, and these images sort of lent credence to the idea, you know, that came along later that it might be a plesiosaurus. But uh, even this photo was, in the 1990s, debunked as a hoax, and uh, it was uh, discovered that it was a, a toy submarine with a sculpted head attached to it, and um, apparently Robert Wilson and others had a, a certain taste for uh, this kind of prank. It reminds me to send you back to some other monstrology episodes, like the one on uh, Charles Waterton and the taxidermy hoaxes, there's this long tradition in British intellectual natural history of, of really hoaxing not just the public but also the academic intellectuals. 
Uh, anyway, it's, a, it's, an, it's an old story. And of course, in the United States, we have our, our own P.T. Barnum as a manifestation of this, uh, of this tendency, too. Uh, it's this, this is what Orwell might have called, you know, the laughter of free men. Uh, there's a sort of tradition, I think, um, in the Anglo-British, uh, in the Anglo-American tradition. Um, so then, you know, in in the 1980s, there was a kind of systematic approach. I remember this in 1987: 20 boats methodically swept the, the lock uh, using sonar equipment, and uh, they found nothing. But um, when I was in Scotland and I'm sort of out on the on the lock and a boat, the uh, the guide was saying, "Well, you know, uh, Nessie could be living inside these deep caves that the sonar might not have detected." So there's an always, you know, it's it's sort of like a religion. There's always a way to save the theory. Um, you sweep the entire lock and show no activity by sonar. But well, what if there are caves protecting the animal down there? It's a little like people debunking religious claims, but there's always a sort of ad hoc solution. So it's almost like you, you decide if you're going to believe in it first and then get the facts to, to fit uh, that belief. Um, in 2011, a very famous photo uh, by George Edwards uh, emerged. And, uh, you know, this, this should have sort of cast a certain amount of skepticism because George Edwards was a tour operator bringing people out onto the lock. In 2013, uh, he admitted that it was a hoax. It was a fiberglass uh, structure. In 2016, Ian Bremmer snapped a very compelling photo. And um, this one still holds, holds sway. Many people disagree about this. It looks like it could be uh, Nessie, but it also looks like three seals that are playing in the water. And um, having spent some time now out there on the Isle of Isla, and in this region, I can say that the seals do look um, like they could pass for some kind of sea creature, especially if you're just seeing parts of them. So, as many of you know, the sort of theoretical possibilities here are that Nessie could be a plesiosaurus, uh, and I'm going to also explain how it could be a giant eel, um, and those are sort of the two main contenders, I think, at this point. The plesiosaurus is a creature that goes back to the early Jurassic period, so we're talking about 200 to around 175 million years ago. And the, the plesiosaurus was discovered in England by Mary Anning, who was an English fossil collector, and she discovered the, the bones of the fossils in 1823. So it, it, le it lends credence to the idea that there could have been some kind of creature in England. Um, there's some problems here. Uh, obviously, the main problem is, is this thing one creature that goes back through history? That seems just patently absurd and ridiculous. How could any creature have a single lifespan that's that long? And then two, is it part of an interbreeding population of creatures that are sort of like living fossils? And that sort of is compelling, but then you need a fair number of them, or at least maybe 30 of them, to be interbreeding. And that makes the likelihood of their going undetected, you know, um, more more um, pressing. And uh, of course, there are sightings. Like there's usually several. There's like ten a year or something. So you could argue that well, there is enough um, actual sightings to to sort of bear out the possibility of an interbreeding population. There is some evidence that plesiosaurs. Um, could have lived in fresh water. Recent paleontology suggests that they, they did live in uh, fresh water and salt water. But uh, some compelling uh, data came up recently because they did DNA sampling all around the lock. And um, what they re revealed was significant eel populations. They didn't find DNA for like giant sturgeon or some kind of mysterious reptiles, but they did find a lot of eel DNA. And so one suggestion is that this could be a gigantic or maybe a whole uh, group of gigantic eels. And you think, well, maybe that doesn't sound compelling, but really there are record sizes of giant uh, eels. There's a giant moray eel that can grow up to 13 feet long. And um, if that's living in the lock, uh, to my money, it qualifies as a monster. And then within Scottish folklore, there's the Kelpie tradition. 
And some of you may know this tradition, it's very sort of famous in Scotland. It's the idea of a black horse-like creature that lives in the water and it can shapeshift into a humanoid. And then this human-like creature lures kids or adults to their watery grave. And this is a fairly a popular form of Scottish folklore. You see sculptures of it and uh, lots of stories about it and we think that it probably was used to sort of scare kids to stay away from the lake or the river uh, just so they don't drown. So again, this is part of that wonderful tradition that we've talked about many times on Monstrology that uh, a monster might have a kind of core reality at the center of it that then is just built up through exaggeration uh, and story and folklore. And um, the monsters may be entirely frivolous, but they may have adaptive significance too. So staying away from deep water, murky water, um, where you might drown is a highly adaptive um, human phobia. So there's all kinds of reasons why it may have been selected for, if this kind of thing can be selected for. All right, so that's kind of a fun tour of my one of my favorite monsters, which is the Loch Ness Monster. And it was great to get out on the lake itself and to drink a few drams of really good scotch uh, floating around on top of Loch Ness. All right, if you like this kind of thing, please hit subscribe and come back for more content, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.